Now, today, we're in part three of a 48-day journey on how God meets your five deepest needs through a local church family. So if you get out your message notes, one of your deepest needs is to leave a legacy behind you. Now, some people try to do this through accomplishments or through achievements or through writing a book or building the building, put their name on it. But you know what? All of those things are going to leave a temporary legacy because they're all going to fade away. The only thing that's going to last forever that's here alive right now on planet Earth is God's family, the church, and the people that are in it. So if you really want to leave a lasting legacy, if you really want to make an eternal impact, the greatest thing you can do is bring somebody else into God's family with you. The greatest thing you can do for somebody is to cure, secure their eternal salvation. Because when you do that, guess what? That person will thank you for the entire rest of eternity. I'm in heaven because of you. There's no greater legacy than bringing somebody into the family of God. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at sharing your hope with others. One of the five purposes of God for his church and for your life. And Jesus has a lot to say about this. In fact, he talked about it over and over and over. So let's begin with me pointing out just maybe four of the many, many statements of Jesus about sharing your hope with other people. That's talking about Christ to people who don't know Jesus yet, who haven't began that friendship. Let's look at a few verses. They're at the top of your outline in Matthew, excuse me, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus said, wherever you go in the world, tell everyone the good news. Now, I want you to notice, he says, wherever you're going, in other words, as you're going, it's not like you have to make a special trip. He says, wherever you go, just talk to me, talk to other people about me, anywhere. Could be at the grocery store, could be at school, could be in a workout. Where, when you go to a soccer game, when you go to a party, he says, everywhere you go, share the good news about me. Then Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, you will be my witnesses. Now, I want you to circle that word, witnesses. God has called you to be a witness for him in the world. If you're a child of God, if you're in the family of God, then he says, I want you to be my witness. Now, do you know in a courtroom the difference between an attorney and a witness? Big difference. An attorney's job is to make the case. An attorney's job is to present the evidence. An attorney's job is to call for a decision. That's not your job. He says, he didn't say, you will be my attorneys. He says, you will be my witnesses. What does a witness do? A witness just says, I saw this. That guy walked from point A to point B. I saw this happen. All you do is tell your story. God doesn't expect you to be a defense attorney for him. He doesn't need any attorneys. But he does expect you to be a witness and say, this is what happened in my life. Now, another verse where Jesus talks about sharing your hope is in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19 and 20, which, as we know, is called the Great Commission. And Jesus says, I have been given all authority. Why? Because he created the universe, so he's been given all authority over the universe. So, he says, I've been given all authority, so go make disciples. Now, these were some of the very last words of Jesus before he goes back to heaven. It's called the Great Commission. It's what this Saddleback Church was built on, that verse, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. And we, he says, have been authorized to do this by Jesus, who holds all the authority in the universe. So really, you are an agent of God. He says, I've been given all authority in the world, and so I'm authorizing you to go make disciples. That means bring people into the family of God. Help them become followers of Jesus. Then one other verse that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, he actually said this verse at the very beginning of his ministry as opposed to at the end. And he gathers a small group of, of you know, fishermen and carpenters and just normal, ordinary people. None of them had been to school. None of them had any higher education. And he says this, follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people. Now, these are some of the very first words of Jesus to his followers, and I want you to note the logic. He says, follow me, and I'll teach you to fish for men. So the logic is, if you're not fishing, you're not really following. Hello? 
if you're not really fishing, you're not following. He says, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of people. Teach you how to fish for people. The proof that you are truly in God's family is that you're bringing other people into God's family. Is anybody gonna be in heaven because of you? Have you ever led anybody to faith in Christ? Now, those are four verses from Jesus. Let me give you one more from Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul tells us we are Christ's ambassadors. God uses us to speak as though Christ himself is making this appeal. God wants you to connect with him in a friendship. The word for that in the theological term is the word reconciliation. God wants you to connect with him in a friendship, to be reconciled to God. Now he says, we're ambassadors. What's an ambassador? Well, an ambassador is somebody who's a representative of a higher power. They don't actually have the power, but they represent the Queen of England or the President of the United States or the government of Germany or the government of China or Argentina or uh, the Philippines. And these countries send out ambassadors all around the world. And the Bible says that God says, you, you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. That means everywhere you go, you represent Jesus. Now, you're either a good ambassador or a bad one. You are an ambassador. You are a witness. The only question is, is whether you're an effective one or an ineffective one. Now, by the way, this is where the term Christian comes from. You know, the word Christian actually just means little Christ. And as the church began to grow after Jesus was resurrected, then these little Christ's, these ambassadors of Jesus went out all over the Middle uh, uh, East and then all over Europe. And that's where we get the term Christian or Christian. It means I'm just a little Christ, I'm an ambassador. Now, from just these four verses, we can conclude uh, an important fact about your life. I want you to write this down. The four verses by Christ and the one verses, quote, quote from Paul. Write this down. My job in God's family is to invite others to join us. My job in God's family is to invite others to join us in God's family. Now, I know what many of you are thinking. You're thinking, you know, Rick, I'm just not qualified to do this. And you think it requires some kind of special personality or you have to be a salesman and you have to be good at closing the deal and persuading people. And maybe you, it requires a personality trait that you don't possess, or maybe you're shy or you have no confidence in doing this. Well, what I wanna do today in this message is two things. First, I wanna share with you five things that you need to remember that are gonna give you confidence. If you'll remember these things, you'll have confidence in being an ambassador of Jesus Christ and in sharing your hope in Christ. Five things to remember. Then I wanna give you six things that you can actually do this week from God's word. Uh, practical ways of how to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ and how to share your hope with others. All right, so first, let's look at five things to remember that are gonna give you confidence. Are you ready? Write these down. Number one. Everybody I meet has the same longings that I do. Everybody you meet, everybody I meet, have the same inner longings that I do, that you do. You see, you didn't stop becoming a human being when you were born again into the family of God. You still have the same basic human drives and desires and uh, longings that everybody else does. Why? Because God created us all. God put those longings in us. In the Bible, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, the first part of that verse says this, God has planted eternity in the human heart. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that we all have dreams that there's more to life than we're experiencing. And the fact is, it's true. There is a whole lot more to life than we're experiencing because there's so much more to life than just getting out of bed and going to work and coming home to sleep and repeating the process over and over and over. Every human being was made for so much more than just get up, go to work, sleep, and, and go back to work. Instinctively inside ourselves, every human being knows that something is missing. And we try to fill that heart, we try to fill that hole in our heart with, with many different things. 
but it's a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. You can't fill it with sex or salary or status or money or passions or possession or position. We try to fill it with so many different things. You know, today, many people have built their lives on trying to achieve what is called the good life. In other words, looking good, feeling good, having the goods. And here in Southern California, we're pros at living the good life. The only problem with the good life is it's not good enough. It leaves us unsatisfied. It doesn't quench our hunger for meaning and significance. And that hunger can only be filled, only be satisfied with what Bible calls the better life, the better life. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 15, in the message paraphrase says this, Jesus included everyone in his death, so everyone could be included in his life, a resurrection life, a far better life. You might circle that if you're taking notes. A far better life than people ever lived on their own. This is not the good life. There's something better than the good life. It's the better life. Jesus says it again in John chapter 10, verse 10. Again, the message paraphrase, he says, I've come so that you can have real life and eternal life. Real and eternal life. A better life than you ever dreamed of. So what am I saying? That when we share our hope with other people, what we have to offer people is exactly what everyone is looking for because we all have the same deep longings in life. We all long for security. Doesn't matter what religious background you have. We all long for a sense of self-worth. We all long for significance. We want our lives to matter. We all have a longing for belonging, to feel that we're connected to a family. We all have a yearning for learning, to feel like we're growing and developing and becoming more than we used to be. We all have a hunger for meaning and for purpose and for direction in life. And only our Creator can provide these things. Now, what am I saying? that what we're offering to people is what everybody's looking for. We all have the same basic longings. Now, not only does everybody you meet have the same longings that you do, number two, everybody has the same questions. Everybody that you meet, whether they're a believer or non-believer, have the exact same questions that you do. In Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 11, the Bible in this part says this, none of us can ever fully understand all God has done but he puts questions in our minds about the past and about the future. You know all those questions you have in your mind? They're from God. What are those questions that God puts in your mind? Questions like, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Does my life have any purpose? What happens after I die? What is my significance? What is the meaning of everything that happens to me? These are not small questions, but they're the questions that everybody asks. And so when you talk to people, the answer to the fundamental questions of life are found in Jesus Christ and in his word. Let me give you a third thing that you need to remember that'll give you confidence in sharing your hope. Number three, most people don't really know what they believe. In fact, they often contradict themselves often contradict themselves. You know, people are often quick to label themselves. They'll say, you know, I'm a Muslim, or I'm a Buddhist, like that's gonna shut you down, or I'm a Hindu, or I'm an atheist, or I'm some brand of Christianity, or, or whatever. But you know what I've discovered, having talked to thousands of people, that when you scratch beneath the surface, you often find that people who adopt a certain label don't even know what that belief system believes. <laughs> Last week I was in Washington, D.C., and I started a conversation with my taxi driver, and he said, I'm a Muslim. But you know what? As I engaged him, I discovered he knew almost nothing about Islam. I probably knew more than he did. In fact, at one point he even said, you know, I think we all believe the same thing. Well, I guarantee you, Muhammad would certainly have agreed with that. He would have disagreed with that. We don't all believe the same thing. So if you think we do, it means you don't even know what you believe. So don't be turned off by titles and labels that people use as defenses. And by the way, a lot of people claim to believe a certain way, but they sure don't act that way. For instance, I've had a lot of people tell me, well, you know, Rick, there are no absolutes in life. Well, in the first place, that's nonsense. That is an absolute statement. So you're contradicting yourself by the statement itself. But they, they, they say, there are no absolutes in life, 
but I want to ask, do you stop at every stoplight? Well, yeah. They live by rules that are based on absolutes every single second of their lives. Most people are inconsistent and they contradict themselves over and over and they're confused. But when you share your hope in Christ, it helps bring clarity, clarity to their lives. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 says this, God is not a God of confusion, okay? God is not a God of confusion, but he's a God of peace. And in John chapter eight, verse 32, Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free free from confusion, free from contradiction, free from all these other things that bind up your life. Now here's a little secret that you need to understand about human behavior. <laughs> Are you ready for this? People make almost all of their decisions, make almost all of their choices in life based on emotions. And then they go look for intellectual reasons to back up their emotional decisions. We only use logic often to back up an emotional decision that we want to make. And we make it on our gut or on our feelings, on our emotions. You know, I, I meet so many Christians who are afraid of being a witness, of talking to anybody about the Lord because they think they're gonna have to argue intellectual ideas. When the truth is, most intellectuals are making their decisions based on emotions and feeling. And any, anyone can, can deal with emotions and can deal with feelings. You don't have to be an intellectual to do that. Let me give you a fourth thing. Write this down. Anyone can be saved if I listen for the key to their heart. Anyone can be saved if I listen for the key to their heart. And that key is their unmet need or hidden hurt. Their unmet need or hidden hurt. You know, in Romans chapter three, verse 23, it says this, everyone falls short of God's glorious ideal. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that I don't measure up to my own standards, much less God's perfect standards. And it means that we all have habits and we all have hurts and we all have hangups and we all live in a broken world. We all fall short of God's glorious ideals. So guess what? We all have hurts and habits and you know, things in our lives that are secret that we don't want other people to know about. You can discern these things by listening to what is the deepest hurt in a person's heart. And if you discern that, guess what? You've just discovered how to lead them to Jesus. Now, listen to this. There's only one way to God the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But there are many reasons and many ways that people come to Jesus. Did you hear that? There's only one way to God the Father, that's through Jesus. But there are many reasons that people come to Jesus. Some people came to Jesus for a miracle. Some came to Jesus because of a question. Some came out of loneliness. And the same is true today. Some people come with questions and loneliness. Some people come out of guilt and shame. Other people come to Christ because they're afraid, they're going through a fearful experience. Some people are looking for purpose. Some people have a physical need that draws them to God. Others have an emotional need that draws them to God. Others have a relational crisis or a financial crisis. There are thousands of different reasons people turn to God. Stress and pain and suffering all have a way of getting our attention. Now, if you really wanna reach somebody for the Lord, you find their felt need or their hidden hurt, their unmet need, and you'll find that this is the key to opening up the conversation. That means you're gonna to have to listen. Number five, fifth thing you need to remember, and this is gonna give you confidence. Remember this, people have excuses, but we have God's Holy Spirit and the truth. They only have excuses. They only have you know, their excuses, but we have God's Holy Spirit in us and we have the truth. And in that matchup, the Holy Spirit and the truth are always gonna win eventually. You see, you're not alone when you share your hope in Christ. God is with you. And the Holy Spirit is working in that other person's heart while you're talking. They've only got themselves. You've got you and God's Holy Spirit. That should give you a lot of confidence. Second Timothy 1, seven and eight in the Living Bible says this, the Holy Spirit, God's gift to you, does not want you to be afraid of people. 
He doesn't want you to be afraid of people, but he wants you to be wise and strong and to love them and enjoy being with them. And if you will stir up this inner power, God's power inside you, his Holy Spirit, you will never be afraid to tell others about our Lord. That's Second Timothy. You'll never be afraid to tell others about the Lord if you realize the Holy Spirit's power and God's truth is in you. You know, another verse that deals with this is in Luke chapter 21. In verses 13 to 15, contemporary English version, Jesus says this. He's talking to his followers. This will be your chance to tell others about your faith. But don't worry about what you'll say to defend yourselves. I will give you the wisdom to know what to say. So many times we get anticipatory fear. We think, I don't know what to say to that person at the office. I don't know what to say to that person, that soccer mom or that neighbor. Well, God says, I will tell you what to say when you need it. And you'll find that God does it in such an amazing way. Now, how do I share my hope? Let me give you some practical steps. I'll give you six practical steps, okay? How do you share your hope? Number one, real simple, write it down. Live it. Live it. Live your hope. Live a life of hope. Long before you ever talk about it, just live it. First Peter chapter two, verse 12 says this, live such good lives among your unbelieving neighbors that they see, circle that, that they see the good things in you, the good things you do, and then they will honor God by believing. Live in such a good way in front of your unbelieving neighbors, they see the good things you do, and they will honor God by believing. What does that verse teach us? That you need to be an audio-visual believer. You gotta both walk the walk and talk the talk. You gotta be audio and you gotta be visual. You, you, you've gotta live it in front of others. I told my staff the other day, talking about our culture, if they like what they see, they will listen to what we say. If they like what they see, they will listen to what we say. So we start by sharing hope by simply living hopeful lives. Now, this involves a lot of times just being nice to people. Why? Because you cannot win your enemies to Christ. You can only win your friends. They've got to become your friends before they can become Christ's friends. See, before people say, is Jesus real? They want to know, are you real? Before they want to know, is the Bible legitimate? Can it be trusted? They want to know, are you legitimate? Can you be trusted? Before they want to know, is, is, is everything that the scripture teaches credible? They want to know, are you credible? So it just starts by, by being nice to people, building bridges of friendship. Outreach, evangelism, witnessing is simply, you build a bridge of love between your heart and theirs, and Jesus walks across. That's why Romans 12, verse 13 says this, two words, practice hospitality. Romans 12, 13, practice hospitality hospitality. What is hospitality? Well, it's just making people feel welcomed and wanted. It means living your life in such a way you invite them into your home. You share meals with them. You have a barbecue with them. You go to a game with them. You live your life with them. I could give you so many illustrations. Do you know that in the first year of Saddleback, first two years of Saddleback Church, every Tuesday and every Thursday, we had people in our homes for two years. Kay cooked the same meal every week so we didn't have to worry about what to buy or the planning. It was all about having people in our home, showing hospitality. And in the first two years of this church, every single person who came to this church was invited to my home. And we did it for two years. Every single person got invited to a meal. This church was built on hospitality. The A in Saddleback's name, which is now All Nation Congregation, used to be Atmosphere of Acceptance, which is the hospitality point of our values. Why? Because we didn't have an H in the word Saddleback. So we called it Atmosphere of Acceptance. So you've got to live a life of hospitality and love in front of people, and a life of hope. Then number two, after you live it, learn it. You need to learn more about the hope that is within you. You know you've got hope, but you may have a hard time expressing it. First Peter chapter three, verse 15 says this, always be ready to answer anyone who asks you to explain the reason for the hope that you have. 
but do it with gentleness and respect. Did you know that never in the Bible you told to share your faith? The Bible says share your hope. And it says do it with gentleness and respect. Now, how in the world can I learn to be ready? It says always be ready. You need to be ready when people ask you a question, why, why do you live the way you do? And they see something different in your life. They see the hope in you. You need to learn how to discover your life message and your life mission. God wants to communicate something through you to the world that only you can communicate. And, and when you learn to communicate your life message and your life mission, then you're gonna be sharing your hope. You'll be ready to share. Here's the third thing. You gotta live it and you gotta learn it. Here's number three, apologize for not sharing sooner. Now let me explain this. What do you mean by that? Apologize for not explaining sooner. Okay, picture this in your mind. Do you have people in your life who are not believers and you've known them for a long, long time, maybe five years, 10 years, maybe even 20 years. You may have lived next to a neighbor forever and you've never talked to them about the Lord. And now you're kind of embarrassed because you've been neighbors so long and you've never talked to them about it. And now you feel awkward about bringing it up. How do you break the ice in talking to somebody about the Lord that you've known for some time and have never talked to them about it? Just apologize. Now, here's how I would do it. You go, let's say you've got a next door neighbor, you've never talked to about the Lord, never invited him to church, and you go to him and you say, let's say his name's Joe. You say, Joe, I need to apologize to you. Now that's gonna get their attention right off the bat. Okay, what have you done wrong? I need to apologize. And they said, well, what? Sure, yeah, well, you know, whatever. What do you need to apologize for? Well, you know, friends don't keep secrets from friends. And I consider you to be a close friend. You're a good friend. You've been a good neighbor for many years. And I've, I, 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 I've never talked to you about the most important thing in my life. And, and I'm really sorry, I'm embarrassed about it. Because honestly, I, I kind of thought that if I shared it with you, you'd think I was a nut or a kook. Or, or some goofy person, and I, I really thought that maybe you'd think less of me, and I know that's dumb, and I, I'm sorry, I should have thought more of our friendship, it's stronger than that, I know that, and so I, I ask you to forgive me. Now the guy's dying to hear what you're gonna say, and you say, you know what, uh, I, I just need to tell you that the most important thing in my life is my friendship with God. I've learned how to have a relationship with God, and I'd love sometime to talk to you about it and tell you about it. Well, now you've just opened the door. So apology evangelism is the way you start with somebody you haven't talked to in a long time. You know, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26. It's a very difficult verse to translate. If you read it in different translations, it's, it's all different ways. But I think that today's English version gets the closest to the original meaning of the Hebrew. And Proverbs 12, 26 says this in the TEV. The righteous person is a guide to his friends. The righteous person is a guide to his friends. And what you wanna do if your friends are somebody, you wanna guide them in the right way. You care enough about them, you want them to spend an eternity in heaven with you. You don't wanna be separated from, from them from eternity. And a righteous person is a guide to his friends. Another verse, Proverbs 17, 17 says, friends always show their love. And the most loving thing you can do is to show somebody how they can have their past forgiven, get a purpose for living, and get a home in heaven by opening their heart to the grace of God. Friends always show their love. It's unloving to not tell people the good news. All right? Let me give you a fourth thing you can do. You can practice this week. You learn it, and you, 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 you live it, and you, you apologize for not talking about it. Number four, listen first. Listen first, and by the way, ask questions. Write that down too. Listen first and ask questions. You will always bring more people to Christ by listening to them than by talking to them. Why? Because everybody on this planet has a deep, deep hunger to be listened to, to be understood, to have their feelings validated, to not to not just blow it off, but to really listen. And very few people in this world care enough to actually listen to, to people, to their neighbors and friends. That's why people pay big money to go to counselors, 
because very few people care enough to actually listen to their friends. Your ear is a great tool for showing love to someone. This is a huge tool. Proverbs 18 verse 13 in today's English version says this, always listen before you answer. If you don't, you're being stupid and insulting. Now you remember that verse earlier we talked about said always be ready to share your hope and always be ready to give an answer to people who ask you about the hope that's in you? Well, the second part is always listen first before you share it. Always listen. And that's where you're gonna find the key to their heart. Proverbs 20, verse five, today's English version says this, a person's thoughts are like water in a deep well, but somebody with insight can draw them out. Can you, that's a beautiful picture. A person's thoughts are like water in a deep well, but someone with insight could draw them out. How do you draw it out of people? How do you find their hidden hurt? How do you find their deep need, unmet need, their felt need? By asking questions. The way you draw something out of people is by asking questions, and then after they've answered the question, say, well, tell me more. And then ask it again, well, tell me more. And what else? And you just keep letting them talk. You know, a lot of people are worried that I've got to go out there and prove that God exists. No, you don't have to do that. First place, most people don't doubt God's existence. There are arguments out there, theological and teleological arguments for the existence of God. The cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the ontological argument, Kant's moral reproof. These are all things, if you go to seminary, you have to learn the arguments for the existence of God. But you know what? Most people couldn't care less. Again, they're living at the emotional level. It's not your job to prove God's exist. It's your job to just show the grace of God to them. Now that goes in and along with my fifth suggestion, write this down, share your stories. Share your stories. You don't have to be going to the Bible for everything, just share what's happened to you. Now this is called, as you know, your testimony. You notice I say share your stories, plural, not share your story, why? Because you have many testimonies. A lot of people think they only have one testimony, the testimony of how they came to Christ, how, how they were saved, but has God ever helped you with a financial problem? Then you have a financial testimony. Has God ever helped you with a relational problem? Then you have a relational testimony or marriage testimony. Has God ever helped you with dating? Then God, you've got a dating testimony. Has God ever helped you when you were going through a crisis or grief or you lost someone or you were worried or you were sick? You have hundreds of testimonies. You know, the power of a testimony is that you are the authority. You're not pointing to anybody else. There's people in today's age who go, well, you said it, it's you are the authority on your life. Nobody's a better authority on your life than you. Now the Bible, of course, is filled with testimonies of people. Uh, one time Jesus healed a blind guy and, uh, and the Pharisees kind, kind of came to him and tried to trap him with some theological questions and discussion, tried to pin him down in the identity of Jesus. And, the guy was really smart and he just resorted back to his testimony. And he did that because when you have a testimony, you're the authority on it. And in John chapter nine, verse 25, when they come and say, who do you think Jesus is? He goes, well, you know what? I'm not, I don't know what you're gonna argue about, but I do know this, I was blind, but now I can see. That's a testimony. You have lots of I was blind, but now I can see testimonies about parenting, about uh, dieting, about uh, sleeping well, about dealing with stress, about dealing with pressure, and all the other things in your life. You have hundreds of testimonies. Finally, let me give you one more suggestion. Number six, bring them to worship. This is one of the best ways that you can share your hope with people who are struggling without hope. Did you know that studies show that people come to Christ quicker when they do it in the context of a larger group of people rather than just by one-on-one? -on -one? So when you talk to your neighbor, your friend, your coworker about the Lord, but then you bring them to church and they walk into a service and they see a lot of other people, hundreds of people, or maybe even thousands, who believe the same thing, that's called a corporate witness and has enormous emotional and spiritual power. And when people come and see other people together, 
believing the same thing. It adds credibility to what you have shared with your friend. And your friend thinks, he looks around and goes, wow, there are a lot of people here who believe this. They couldn't all be crazy. I mean, they might doubt you, but they, they can't, couldn't all be crazy. This is why Jesus wants us to bring people into his church family and actually bring them to worship services. In Luke chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus said this, go into the streets and everywhere else and invite anyone you find to come with you so that my house will be full. Notice that God wants a full house. He wants a full house. He wants everybody saved. When was the last time you invited somebody to church? Care enough to bring somebody with you next weekend. You know, when you do that, you're gonna watch, you're gonna see church from a whole different perspective when you sit next to somebody who's never been in a service before. And you see all of the things go, now I get why we do this. Now I see why we do this at Saddleback. And I have seen the reality of Psalm 40 verse three happen thousands and thousands of times at Saddleback Church when people brought their friends to church. Psalm 40 verse three says this, many people will see this, what? The service of worship, and they will worship him. Then they will trust the Lord. Notice that worship leads to outreach. Or worship leads to conversion. Then they will trust the Lord. When people who don't yet have a friendship with God watch believers give thanks to God, like in singing, it is a powerful witness. And this is why the first church in Jerusalem actually grew to over 100,000 members in less than 20 years, because the worship was there and everybody was bringing their friends to the temple. Acts 2 verse 47 says this, as they worshiped God, people in the community liked what they saw. And as a result, every day their number grew as God added those who were being saved. All right? Now I've given you, you know, uh, five or so reasons why you should have confidence and six or so steps to just get stuck going. Let me wrap this up by just concluding with why. Why do we do this? Why do we share our hope? Well, let me just give you three, three or four reasons real quick. Number one, everybody needs Jesus. The reason we share our hope is because everybody needs Jesus. You know, if I had the cure for cancer or AIDS or dementia and I didn't share it with everybody, that would be criminal. They should lock me up and put me in prison. If I knew how to cure people's cancer or AIDS or dementia or some other thing, it would be criminal if I didn't pass it on. We have something even better, how to have eternal life, past forgiven, purpose for living, home in heaven. It would be criminal to not share it with others. Look at this verse, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Jesus says in the message paraphrase, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life and I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it, Jesus says. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Who doesn't want that? It's not like you're trying to get people to eat cat food or something. <laughs> you know, what most people reject is not true Christianity. What most people reject is a misconception of it. Jesus says, you got needs in your life, come to me and I will meet that need, I will give you rest. So we do it because everybody needs Jesus. The second reason we do it is because Jesus commands us to do it. We looked at those commands at the very start, that this church, Saddleback, exists because of his great commission to go make disciples. Mark chapter eight, verse 38, he said, Jesus said this, very, very sobering verse. Look at this verse, Mark 8, 38. Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me and my message in these sick and sinful days, I will be ashamed of you when I return in glory. Whoa, whoa. We do this because God commands us to do it. Do you care more about what people think than about what God thinks? Are you more worried about your reputation than, than their salvation? 
Are you ashamed of Jesus? Why? I mean, maybe, maybe if you're ashamed of Jesus, maybe you don't really have a friendship with him yet. You need to get to know him. Jesus commands us to share our hope. Third reason we share our hope is because we're grateful to God and we love people. 2 Corinthians 5.14, the Bible says, Christ's love compels us. Christ's love compels us because we know that he died for all. We are motivated by love. People ask me, what motivates you, Rick? Year after year after year at Saddleback Church, I love Jesus Christ with all my heart and I love people. And that compels us. You know, there's a point where Jesus one time is up on a hill and he looks out the whole city of Jerusalem and in passionate cry, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her brood, but you would not have me. Can you hear the verse that the passion had? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I have prayed that prayer so many times as I've been up on a hill saying, oh, Saddleback Valley, Saddleback Valley, how much I would have gathered you to bring you the good news. And then as we expanded to Orange County, Southern California, oh, Southern California, Southern California, how much I would have gathered you together and shared with you the good news of Christ if you'd just listen. And now I, with campuses around the world, I say, oh, world, how, how, how I, I plead and beg for you to listen to the good news of Jesus Christ. We do it out of love. Finally, the Bible says that you will be rewarded in heaven. That when you share your hope with others, you will be rewarded in heaven. Proverbs 11 verse 30 says this, good people give life to others like a fruit bearing tree and those who save souls are wise. Do you wanna be wise? Save souls. You want, to, you want to bear fruit? You want to be a tree of life? You want to leave a legacy? The way you leave a legacy is by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, for since we were restored to friendship with God by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be delivered from eternal punishment by his life. Romans 5.10, what a, what a great promise. You will be rewarded in eternity for the people you brought with you. Is anybody going to be in heaven because of you? Let me close in prayer. The Bible says that God wants us to be witnesses. But a lot of times, we're what I call Arctic River Christians. We're frozen at the mouth. And, and we don't say anything and we, we hold back. But Jesus says, if you're not fishing, you're not following. So let me encourage you to right now, in your mind, I want everybody to think of one person. Think of a name of somebody who you love who doesn't know Jesus yet, okay? Think of a name of somebody you love who doesn't know Jesus yet. And I'm gonna ask you to ask God to give you the privilege of bringing that person into the family of God in the next year, in the next 365 days. Would you do that right now? It could be your greatest legacy that somebody's going to be in heaven because of you. Let me pray for you and then I'll lead you in a prayer. Father, you know everybody who's watching this video online and at all of our campuses. And I know that you've called us to make disciples, to be a witness, to share our hope, to not hold back, to be ambassadors for Christ. And Lord, if we don't do it, we're disobedient. We're not following your will. And so I pray that this message today will motivate each of us to get serious about the people in our lives that we love who still don't know you. Neighbors, friends, coworkers, people we meet in, in uh, social settings. Now you pray. Say, dear God, I want you to use me to bring somebody to you. Just pray that. Say, dear God, I want you to use me to bring somebody to you in the next year. Help me to remember that your Holy Spirit is with me and I have the truth and they just have excuses. Help me to remember that everybody has the same longings and the same questions and that you are the answer to those and that everybody needs Jesus. Give me the love that I need to care enough to share your good news with those around me, to invite people to church, to share 
a word of testimony, to share how you've changed my life, and maybe even to apologize to someone that I haven't talked to about it that I've known for a long time. And I humbly ask for your help this week in Jesus' name. Amen.